Peter will be our 200th anniversary chair in international business. So please. Uh, Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge um, uh, honour and a fitting uh, tribute to uh, Peter's huge contribution to international business uh, research and, and teaching. I understand also that the timing is, is excellent. Uh, Peter recently reached a major milestone um, in his own scholarship, uh, attaining an H index of, of 100. So, um, I think we'd, uh, we're, so we're, we're very much uh, after that introduction, looking forward to um, to what uh, to what Peter has to, to say uh, this evening. And the title of this evening's lecture is "The Kaleidoscope of International Business: Evolving Phenomena, Big Questions, and Grand Challenges." So it looks like it will be a tour, a uh, tour de force. And uh, very much looking forward to um, uh, Peter uh, taking us through international business uh, theory and how it has has changed over the past uh, sixty years. Looking at how we create theory, how we react to theory, and how we use it to address the emerging grand challenges that so, uh, uh, so threaten our, our, not only our, our business disciplines, but um, the very human uh, race. So the normal uh, arrangements uh, will, uh, will prevail. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. We have an online audience and the normal rules of engagement apply. Raise your hand. Um, online or in the in the room, and we'll be able to take plenty of, of questions uh, after Peter's lecture. And Mario Kafuros will uh, will uh, will manage the question and answer session. So, without any further ado, uh, I'll hand over to, to Peter. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. It's a great honour. It's a great pleasure and privilege to do this. And thank you all for coming. I was born. 11 miles from here in a cotton town called Mosley, more accurately pronounced Mosley. And uh, three of my four grandparents worked all their lives in cotton mills and the fourth was a professional soldier. Neither of my parents went past primary school despite my mother winning the award for the best student in the town. So this is for them. Um, I I thought long and hard about what metaphor to try and use to describe globalization and the trajectory of globalization and the way that international business theory has tried to keep up with, to explain and predict the way that international business and globalization has gone. I thought of a roller coaster, but a roller coaster only goes in one direction. Uh, I thought of various other things, but I think the kaleidoscope works well because the idea of the kaleidoscope is that things are changing. And as we know, over the past 60, 50 years, international business has changed dramatically and is continuing to change. And the other thing about the kaleidoscope is it brings in the role of the viewer. So where we stand and where we look through at this picture of international business, this changing picture, this evolving picture, is really important. So different people will see different patterns by looking by the stance that they take. And my, my stance is, is very simple, really. My mantra is there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And my argument is that the, the way we can track and the way we can predict and the way we can understand international business is through a good theoretical lens. See what I'm doing here. There we go. Now we're at a very 
we're up, there's always turning points in international business, but I think we're currently in a really important aspect, really important change of view on the subject. Uh, we could crudely call this a change from the boardroom view to the bird's eye view. So instead of looking at international business purely through the eyes of managers and multinationals, we're now also seeing it through the eyes of society, its impact on society and so on. So this focus on global business means we have to use interdisciplinary methods. We have to use multi-level approaches because international business is fantastic in that it looks at the role of the manager, the role of the firm, the role of the industry, the nation, and the global economy. So we're looking at a whole range of different influences on international business. One of the things when we design research projects in international business is how do we hold the other factors constant in order to focus on the level that we're looking at. So I think the, 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 uh, the, this is opportune. The phenomenon, international business has always been, and I think I can illustrate that as we go through it, a phenomenon driven subject. And because it is phenomenon driven, we can easily be taken along by fashion and current changes, unless we have a rock to stand on. And I think that rock is theory. So how, let's go right back and look at the way the subject was created. Where does an academic subject come from? It's a really interesting question. And the date that's typically used for the start of international business is Heimer's thesis. And Heimer's thesis, Stephen Heimer's thesis was written in 1960. And interestingly, it had the title, The International Operation of National Firms. So at that stage, people were the focus that people were using was this is a national firm that goes abroad, that goes into other countries. That, that was the kind of focus. And as we move on, I mean, the theory that Mark Casson and I developed looks at it exactly the other way, that the national firm is the exception, that the general case is the multinational and the national firm is a firm that hasn't yet or won't be able to international. But going back to 1960, Heimer, in his thesis, uh, focused very firmly on an anomaly phenomenological anomaly, and that was foreign direct investment. Economic theories didn't explain foreign direct investment. Typical approach was to say that capital moved in response to changes in interest rates. Not only did that not work, foreign direct investment was going in two directions at once. It was going from rich countries to poor countries and so on. So that didn't work. And Heimer focused on the critical factor of foreign direct investment, which is control. Foreign direct investment is defined by its control. So the firm is controlling activities outside its home country. And activities is very important because foreign direct investment isn't just a capital flow. It involves flows of technology and organization. So now Heimer did something that we probably wouldn't recommend our students or ourselves to do. He ignored most of current writing on international business. I wrote a paper called Preheimer Theories. And there were there's masses of stuff. There were theories of imperialism, there were theories of competitiveness, there were theories of competition, there was economic theory, there were there were and there were massively interesting works written by people who today were called practitioners, how to do business in Latin America, how to do business in China, and so on. There was development economics as well. And Heimer just drove a coach and horses through this. Very few citations, clear laser-like focus on explaining foreign direct investment because of the key phenomenon. The key thing being control, but he also introduced the notion of advantages. 
that multinational firms must have some advantage because how can they outcompete a national firm in its own market? So the search was then on for the what for the advantages that firms uh, that firms had. And the Heimer Kindleberger theory essentially looks at the way that a foreign firm in some ways has advantages over a national firm, even in its own market. Because a foreign firm has to overcome cultural problems and what are now called the liabilities of foreigners. And this was taken further by my late old boss, John Dunning, who looks at the advantages in terms of locational advantages, in, in terms of ownership advantages, and then later added internalization. And that's kind of where I came coming to the story, if I can write myself in, which was the move from looking at foreign direct investment as a phenomenon to the firm that, that, that is organizing foreign direct investment. And again, deceptively simple ideas derived from Ronald Coase, the idea that there's two ways of organizing. You either use the market, outsourcing in today's terms, or you internalize it and control it, right? And then you add to that a second very simple, straightforward uh, point, that is the location element, that firms choose the location, the cheapest cost location for all their activities that they control. So the focus then moved from the phenomenon of foreign direct investment to looking at the multinational firm as an organization. The multinational firm is a key player in the global economy. And then, and then we began to notice that multinational firms didn't only carry out foreign direct investment, or if you like, foreign direct investment and exporting. There were lots of other modes of doing international business. So what about alliances? What about joint ventures? What about subcontracting? What about all the non, all the intermediate arrangements between pure internalization on one hand and using the market on the other hand? And alliances became very fashionable. How do you explain alliances and the role of trust and the role of joining together activities that give you uh, extra competitiveness and so on. There was a real phase for alliances. I went to more conferences than it, than it and was good for me, where multinational managers were saying to one another, we've got 51 alliances, oh, we've got 75 alliances. And I constantly made the point, the point of an alliance is not to have an alliance, the point of an alliance is it's the best way to do international business. So we've got there the development of theory, starting from phenomenon of foreign direct investment, moving to the multinational, and then taking a wider aspect of multinational operations, which is going to become the theme for, for later, which is that multinationals don't just internalize activities, they organize what we now call global value chains. Then I think the second third is having established some basic theory in international business. The second phase is that there are some issues that aren't quite covered by the theory. These could be termed challenges to the theory. How does the theory evolve? And these might be called big questions. And the first one, a very stark one, was that a lot of this theory was designed for uh, multinationals from rich countries, Western multinationals, Europe, Japan, um, America. But also out there were lots of multinationals from emerging economies. How do you explain the growth of multinationals from emerging economies? And typically the work was on China and India but also on, in terms of a lot of other, uh, a lot of other, what about Brazil and so on. And there are two ways of looking at a new phenomenon. One is to say, we've got a new phenomenon, we need a new theory. 
And the other way is to say, can we adapt existing theory to take account of a new phenomenon? And not surprisingly, I took the second view, and we took the view that let's try. Let's try and explain uh, the strategies of Chinese multinationals in terms of a theory that wasn't established from. This is a real test because the theory was based on uh, Western, rich, mainly multinational companies, mainly in manufacturing, not state-owned companies, which were very largely not in manufacturing. So Chinese multinationals in particular represented a real test of the theory. And we, we, we ran that and it worked very well, but there was an anomaly. Not surprisingly, it didn't fit perfectly. When you'd explained the strategies of Chinese multinationals, everything worked except for one really anomalous variable, and that was the risk factor. Chinese firms invested in countries that were higher risk, everything else being taken as equal. Petris Paribus, they were going for uh, high risk countries. Why would that be? And then a number of hypotheses came up. Well, they don't understand risk, or B, it's very rational because they're going to markets where Western firms are not going or three, it's all down to politics and so on. So we got a whole new round of theorizing about the relationship between foreign direct investment from emerging market multinationals and their attitudes to risk. So where you've got anomalies in the theory, it allows you to go on and test and explain that and so on. The second challenge, and this is a... a uh, important in the, in, the, in the whole development of international business was the fact that firms were not internalizing activities. There was a big growth in offshoring and outsourcing and the disaggregation of global value chain. So again, the theory needed to be modified in order to take account of what you might call a distributed multinational, a multinational that has not only internalized activities, but also uses lots of other uh, uh, means of, of, of operating in the global market. And disaggregation of global value chains, meaning that lots more countries were being brought in as locations for multinational activity. So the, what we might call a market for market transactions was growing and multinationals were disseminating their uh, activities by using uh, outside firms through offshoring and outsourcing. Now, you might call this, in retrospect, the kind of golden era of globalization. You know, books were being written at this point about the world is flat. The world was never flat, but that the, the the point being made is that you could do activities across lots of uh, markets. There were lots of opportunities for locating parts of your global value chain. And one of the key strategies that multinationals used and still do, of course, is fine slicing. So slicing up all the activities of the firm and asking of each slice, where should it be located? How should it be controlled? And this gave the multinational firm fantastic reach and fantastic opportunities for exploiting all the different uh, variations in costs and activities that were out there in the world economy. This is the big thing that is currently under threat with the so-called fracture in the world economy, division between what you might call a Chinese camp and a Western camp. See, the, the uh, US is actually considering removing most favored nation status from China, which would have a catastrophic effect on the global economy. So this was a kind of golden era. This was a kind of an era where uh, globalization through the kaleidoscope seemed to be 
going uh, really well. And of course, the fracture in the world economy and the move to protectionism and the move to techno nationalism has rather derailed. So we've seen we did the, the uh, I did a project for our Unido, which I call a globally distributed multinational. And a journalist in the audience said, you will never sell that, call it the global factory. And I said, well, it's neither global nor a factory. He said, it doesn't matter, it's a very good phrase. So the way that I used, uh, the way that I approach that is, uh, is the global factory, which looks at both inter internalization and outsourcing of the global value chain. The other thing to note about that is the infrastructure of globalization is very strong. We had a, a globally integrated internet, which is now being split up in the so-called splinter net. The Great Walk Firewall of China started this off. And so you can't even guarantee that the underlying conditions for doing the kind of globalization that you might think ideal uh, is no longer there. So massive problems for multinationals then in having to adjust their strategies uh, from uh, being able to, 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 to reach lots of markets and reach lots of locations in the world, being split by techno-nationalism and, and other forms of protection. The other challenge, the other major challenge, I think, that, that, that came about is the idea that multinationals have a wider responsibility than simply banking profit or simply uh, operating efficiently. And that is the, the, the pressure for social responsibility, sustainability, and so on in their operations, which feeds into the redesign of global value chains. And one of the one of the things that, that's interesting me at the moment and I'm trying to write about is that previously in international business, we've talked a lot about the market constraints on multinationals and governmental regulation constraints on multinationals, but we now have civil society constraints on multinationals. The argument that multinationals should live up to certain ideals of social responsibility, sustainability, and so on. So managers in multinationals have a wide range of issues uh, to think about. So we now move on to the, that leads into really, the argument that uh, theory now should be looked at in terms of grand challenges. And the beauty of grand challenges, if we can put it that way, is that all of them are international. Grand challenges by their very nature are international. You can't solve the climate crisis, you can't solve a lot of the other issues that are grand challenges on a national basis. And here again, we've got huge problems because we've got the loss of faith in international institutions and the loss of funding for international institutions as well. So when, when we look at grand challenges, I think international business is in a fantastic position to start to analyze uh, the issues because it's already, as I said, international. It's very largely interdisciplinary and it could be more interdisciplinary. It spans many levels of analysis, as I've tried to show from the manager right through to the, to the global economy. And it brings in government, business, and civil society. So all of those elements that have been present in international business, the complex interaction with multiple stakeholders, the relationship between business, government, and society, We've been working on this stuff for a long time. It needs refocusing. We need to turn the kaleidoscope and refocus on this. But we have many international businesses really well placed to, to use theory to look at, at grand challenges. So, so, 
we, given that the, the, the new phenomenon that international business is looking at, we have to now try and utilize our knowledge. And we've all got constraints in terms of our abilities and resources and so on to focus the theory on grand challenges and what role can multinationals play in meeting grand challenges. One of my phrases that I've used too often is that multinationals are part of the problem and part of the solution. How do we get multinationals to be more part of the solution and less uh, part of the problem? And so, and so multinationals in this sense are facing not just kind of business challenges, but challenges in terms of governance, uh, sustainability, and so on. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals provide a very good list, we can talk about that if you like, of, of what multinationals should be doing and trying to do. They, in doing that, they face immense pressure from the, the, the fracture in the world economy, and new sources of issues from civil society. Hence the importance, and a lot of people in IB have and are writing on non-market strategies, strategies to try and deal with these non-market pressures. And of course, they're facing doing this in a world economy that is no longer a single integrated economy. So you're looking at friend shoring and reshoring China plus one type strategies and so on. And it's not easy. Uh, there's a recent study done on Russia and multinationals in Russia uh, who uh, declared that they would leave Russia. The actual proportion of multinationals who declared they would leave Russia is under 10%. And it's, it's not easy to pull out in many cases. If, if you make a similar argument with China, how do you replicate the fantastic environment that, that China has provided for multinationals? How do you replicate? So we have some really important challenges facing uh, managers in multinationals. I'm very conscious that there are, in making my narrative, there are a number of issues dear to my heart that I've completely left out. One is the role of culture and how you manage across cultures, which is a really important component of the international business and one that needs to be more integrated. The second is the role of technology and how digitization changes things and how it makes some of this more difficult and a lot of it more easy to reach different markets and so on. And the third thing is the losers from globalization, the left behind. How do we compensate those people who feel that globalization has not benefited them and other people have done better than them, other countries, other regions, other cities have done better than them? I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it, that the old economic Pareto model, the winners compensate the losers. Problem is, there isn't any compensation. So how do we, how do we deal with those challenges? So I think international business over the past 60 years has been an amazing subject. I'm so glad that I've been involved with it. And I think it will continue to be an amazing subject. That's not to say there are challenges, there are problems. We don't have to rethink. We don't have to constantly iterate between phenomenon and theory. But it's a fantastic challenge, and I commend it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and a warm welcome for me as well. For those who don't know me, my name is Mario, of course, I'm a professor of international business and innovation and also the head of one of our four divisions here in the school. So we can start the Q&A. Uh, I will move the upstairs here and I will switch off the... Switch off the... You prefer to stand up? Okay, I will switch off this one so that it's not in front of my... 
recent pressures, especially in the last decade, for social responsibility and sustainability. Of course, we've got all the sustainable goals and development goals and so on. I was thinking, okay, if we go back 30, 40 years, things were very simple back then for the multinational. What we were asking then the multinational to do and managers to do, produce higher returns for your shareholders. I don't mean that they were easy to operate, but the objective was that for your shareholders to produce higher returns. These days, we're asking multinationals to do lots of things. So yes, produce returns, but at the same time, being responsible for the environment, set certain standards, there are 17 different SDGs and so on. We're asking multinationals to do a lot. Now, my question to you is, how do we find that balance? And I know sometimes people will say, well, we need to focus on those goals for social responsibility and, uh, and sustainability. But at the same time, all of us, yeah, at the end of the month, we get paid and we put a fraction of our salary in our pension funds. And pension funds, in turn, invest this money in multinationals. Yeah? So at the end of the day, if we are asking multinationals to do other stuff, this in turn means that the returns to shareholders, us, is lower. And you know, we cannot have both. So it's always you know, very difficult the way I see to balance things. Can we balance things? Or what oh my ask? I think there's a, there's a kind of trite answer and there's a, there's a kind of more nuanced answer. And the trite answer is if we don't do something about it, we won't have much of a planet left. So we've really got there's a long run incentive to put a lot of these things right. And I think uh, you know, a lot of the consequences of uh, unfettered globalization have been negative. You know, massive migration flows to find work and uh, environmental damage and so on. So that's the sort of try answer. The, the, the more nuanced one is, I think we've got to find some ways of incentivizing people to do this. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough to be involved at UNCTAD when there was a prime minister's and president's discussion on precisely this. And I was asked to sum the meeting up, my heart was in my mouth. And uh, what I said was, we've got, what, what you've got to do is find some way to incentivize uh, the decision makers within multinationals to take those kind of decisions. And that's not an easy job because, as you say, you've got, you've got the trade-offs. But I think until we start saying, well, there are rewards for doing this, you know, we can correct externalities by internalizing those externalities and rewarding people for, for dealing with those externalities. That's the way forward, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll open the discussion now. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, can you let us know also your name very briefly, your, your title? My what? Your name. Oh, my name yes. is Christine Barnett. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, you know, you mentioned, um, for example, um, multinationals that may be being established and led by the Western countries. But I think it's all a little bit changing because I know... Oh, oh, oh God. Um, you know, England, I guess it's a dream, but now we've got cost of living, so it's not extremely. If you have to start a business now, which country um, or continent do you see emerging in the next 30 to 40 years? Well, I think the, the, the drift of your uh, your your main point is very true. I mean, we we you know we we kind of noticed uh, that uh, you know emerging country multinational firms from emerging countries were becoming serious competitors. We probably noticed that as we notice a lot of things slightly late, but we did did notice it. And and the question then becomes, you know, what 
it, foreign direct investment used to be what we did to them. And when we find they're doing it to us, we don't always like it. Right? When, when we have foreign companies coming here uh, to the West, let's, let's use it, uh, and, and taking over our companies or our competitors, we don't like it. And that was the situation that, that had happened a lot before. The other part about it, which, which particular countries are really important, it very much depends what you're trying to do. You know, I mean, now China's got this massive lead in electronic vehicles and solar panels and these kind of things. A few years ago, when I was regularly going to China, you could not see across the road from the pollution. So it shows what sustained uh, investment and sustained targeting can do. If you're looking, if you're looking for uh, particular things, uh, you you look you're looking. If you're trying to grow, you need particular inputs. You've got to look for that. Look where the growing markets are. Look where other people in your industry are going. Those would be the kind of ways that I would suggest it. And of course, now of course the. A term I haven't really mentioned that I should have done. Political risk is now big time. You know? Political risk used to be something that uh, was a, a kind of optional add-on. Uh, and now it's not. It's got to be really grounded in, in what you're doing. And, and scenario planning in terms of political risk is really important. So there's a wide range of things to consider when you're considering uh, where you should invest or where a company should set up. One of the uh, one of the things I always used to use for students and others was the doing business in index because that showed you, you know, that, and that got knocked on the head because of corruption and, and so on. But that was really useful because that showed you that you know surprising places were reforming and producing environments that were really useful. I remember a few years ago, Rwanda going rapidly up that list when they reformed and they... So um, you're also looking not only at the factors that I've talked about, but you're also looking at the political environment and and um, and the, cons the policies and the consistency of policies towards what you're trying to achieve. I did my PhD in the Middle Ages on Ireland, and Ireland has had a consistent policy of attracting multinationals with, with low taxes, which they have its problems. But it's had a consistent policy. You don't have to always offer the best incentives, but if you're consistent, uh, multinationals like a, like a, to invest in an environment that they think is, is stable, you know, and then we've got this VUCA term, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which is writ large in multi, I'm trying to write something on that, which is writ, writ large in, in, in uh, for multinationals because they have to consider all those factors. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah. Yeah. So my name is Norman Kai, and I'm basically the first student in Nashville this year. And uh, so when I, I think uh, I, I want to one are your the implications of what you just told us for future of IT use. So uh, that is, I think we have uh, some problem of identity. So because we were talking for many years right now, I do business as well, so what's the question? I think this year, you know, I had a paper like 20 years ago, I think it's generally interesting. And actually, all the messages is going around to describing the uh, fracture of the world, etc. Suddenly, it seems like we have a really environment identity. So, what to do? We have a really what identity? Suddenly, we like all the for me, I did international business study for the things that interfere with human business robots. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think the uh. I'm going to go to my roller coaster one. My roller coaster analogy would be that there are times when international business seems there doesn't seem to be a lot happening, or it's moving in a, in a straight line, either that way or that way. What we have is that we have real volatility, and we have real uh, a real set of issues uh, in a way that never went away, but were dormant. 
and they're now really uh, apparent. And, and one thing I haven't mentioned is war. You know, we've got wars going on. So in addition to all the uh, all the volatility and all the uncertainty, we've got the eruption of, of, of war on the borders of Europe and the Middle East and every, you know, a lot in Africa, you name it. So, so multinationals have have those factors to deal with, and um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's a re- it's a really interesting time. There was there was a time when when things seemed to be very stable, and then China hit us. You know, China came along, and everything was let's all write about China. But now we've got so many fantastic issues to write about and to work on. You know, I can never. Never understand people who say, I'm not quite sure what to do next. Wow, you know, there's, there's so many uh, really interesting areas to work on. And some of, it do- some of it doesn't go away. Some of this comes back. I mean, I started off as a development economist. And, you know, the role development is still there. Poverty is still with us. You know, foreign investment doesn't necessarily go to the least developed countries and so on. So we have some new issues. And we have some old issues that are that are writ large, but we certainly live in interesting times. And I think the future of the international business is trying to get a handle on on those dramatic changes. Uh, and as I say, I come back to my mantra: there's there's nothing as practical as a good theory. If you've got a good theory, you can start to look at this. Thank you, please. So, uh, Andrew James, uh, Professor of the Middle Asian Management Policy. So, you, you mentioned quite quite rightly uh, the growth in protectionism, techno nationalism, and national security as uh, regrettable themes uh, in the global economy. I just wondered, would be interested in your reflections on how well you think IB is addressing those issues, how well theorized geopol- uh, geopolitics yeah. is yeah. in yeah. IB and, and what IB scholars need to do to uh, better address these issues. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's bang on. I think the, uh, uh, you know, you could rewrite a bit of what I said about how we thought politics had gone away and you didn't really have to bother too much about politics because everybody was... Uh, in favour of a particular type of globalisation. You can't assume that anymore. And I think one way uh, of dealing with that set of issues is to look at the people who are experts on it, look at political science and so on. I mean, I've shamelessly adopted the governance triangle, which I lifted from political science, where you look at the, the... the market, government, and civil society, and you think of governance in terms of those factors. So, yes, I think there's a lot to learn. International business has always uh, been a borrower discipline, sometimes possibly too much, but I think those are the kind of areas that we need to both look at and revisit, because if you look back, uh, over international business. I mean, look, up, look, you look at Vernon's study on the obsolescent bargain and the role of politics and the role of business, uh, the role of uh, government in uh, negotiating with multinationals. It's very rich and it's been kind of left. We kind of left it with the obsolescent bargain, sovereignty at bay, these kind of arguments and haven't really developed it. And, and that would be an area I would suggest that there's a lot of really interesting and exciting work to do uh, around the kind of questions that you mentioned and the argument and, and, the, and, the, and the really big question, you know, who gains, who loses from these strategies. Thank you. We will continue taking questions from the audience here, but I would like for me to go also to our online audience. Jim is telling me there are lots of questions. When we take two, yeah. I just want to congratulate uh, Peter on two, two things. Firstly, most international audience ever online we've had. Mm-hmm. Event, you've got people from India, Brazil, Australia, all across Europe, you know, on, on this uh, lecture tonight. 
Secondly, probably the most questions I've ever had online for a lecture as well. We're actually still doing it. Should we admit that? I can't pass all of them. Uh, we will also we'll, we'll send them to you after, don't worry. But two, I did take two questions, please, is that okay? Yeah. Um, first one was uh, uh, in the wake of the pandemic and the geopolitical tensions you talked about, there have been calls for strategic autonomy, new protectionism, i.e., you know, farmers protesting against uh, a trade deal, et cetera. The question here is how do you think these ideas will influence international trade? Um, and the second question is around uh, discrimination. Someone's asking all your views on the modern discrimination, i.e. ethnicity-based or language-based against migrant workers and implications for multinational. Yeah, I think, I think uh, well, I think both of those are, uh, you know, are kind of on the money for where, where we're looking at. The first thing, the the you know again the the, the the there's a long tradition of looking at protectionism and protectionist demands and who gains and who who loses from that and the other issue i mean niron and i have, have been working something something like this because you have of course not a single act of protectionism or a single act of trying to protect farmers, you then get retaliation. You can get retaliation. And, and retaliation may make the situation worse in the first place. So there's a lot of literature on that. It's a big issue. And of course, the thing with protectionism is that people who want protectionism tend to be uh, located together or in a single industry. So they have a very powerful, powerful voice against a, a diffuse group of people who are gaining. The thing on migration is, 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 is a great question. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to work on at the moment is an international business theory of migration, because I think that is an area, actually, that most of the people who, who are practitioners would argue is under theorems. And uh, so migration is really interesting. But... I think in international business, the area that, that probably has most work on, at least most work that I'm aware of, is employment of refugees. And I've seen three or four articles this week on how multinationals can absorb refugees and what the benefits from migrant workers are to multinationals. Um, but again, you know, this phenomenon, the, the, the phenomenon of you know, mass migration and, and individual uh, uh, groups migrating, which is, I think, where the, the uh, discrimination point is, is something we really have to get, get look at, get to grips with. Um, multinationals should, in many cases, be good institutions to deal with uh, discrimination and these kind of issues. I say should because they have lots of experience of operating across lots of different cultures, ethnicities, religions, whatever you care to name. It's not always, uh, it, it, the, the practice isn't always put into practice, if that's not a strange way of putting it. The, their experience isn't always put into practice everywhere. Uh, but there are some very interesting lessons uh, from multinationals on, uh, you know, some work I've done on kind of language discrimination. Do you force people to speak a different language, you know, a single language in the company for efficiency within the company? And if you do, how does that impact on non-native speakers and so on? Um, so there's lot, lot, lots of opportunity. I've also been doing a, a piece on, uh, on uh, multinationals learning from indigenous communities about things like land management and about things like, you know, practices of uh, conservation and so on. Uh, there's, you know, if you go into a country that you're not familiar with, you really shouldn't learn from the people who, who, who are there. And sometimes we think one, way, one size fits all. Uh, and th th that's just come out in the UN uh, Transnational Corporations Journal, where we try to look at means of bringing in indigenous knowledge and combining that with with multinationals so you know there's some there's, 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 this kind of question 
is very much grist to the mill of international business and should be. Good, thank you. Uh, I'll go back to our audience here face to face, but I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to take uh, later on one or two more questions from our own online audience. So, please. Hi, uh, Dennis Fishbacker Smith, I'm Professor of Bristol Resilience at the University of Glasgow. Um, this might be a heretical perspective, Peter. Um, but a lot of what you've talked about, the kaleidoscope metaphor, the notion of holistic approaches, emerging conditions, and then group itself, implies that international business should be, but perhaps isn't, a systems-based discipline. Ah. So the question really is, to what extent do you think the, the grand challenge facing IB theory is to incorporate a systems approach in terms of its theoretical core. Great point. Uh, if, if I take a different view, I mean, I very much regard uh, the world economy as a global system. Uh, and and the, the, the interaction between one part of it and another is, is, is very profound. And I've written a couple of papers and my friend and colleague Mark Casson has done more on the global systems view. And I think that's a really important perspective. And now you've mentioned it, I wish I'd said it during the lecture. Can we take one more question on top of here? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, Simon was here in senior lecture in data science, but thanks for the great statistic. We live in a world with more data and with better methods of data. So, is there a danger, though, that we get driven by the noise that inevitably emerges when we defining the discipline, and that we struggle perhaps to identify what are the very real but very consistent changes that are taking place in the dynamic of our world? Yeah, I think I think the uh, you know that the, the, there's often kind of academic fashion where we go off after uh, particular trends that turn out to be ephemeral, and you know one of the arts is to try and distinguish between what is really basic and really driving the thing and what is not. The role of information again, you know, I had half an hour, if I'd have had three, I might got around to this, uh, the role of information is really crucial, as is misinformation, malinformation, and so on. Uh, and I'm trying to do a paper at the moment looking at how misinformation and malinformation distorts global value chains, because that, that's that's a major threat now with AI and with, with malign actors in the system and so on. So yes, I think I think you know in a sense you put your, your finger on the basic problem, which is that you have to identify the real underlying trends and, and as you put it, ignore the noise, or as I would might put it, ignore fashionable trends. And and again, my answer to that would be you know be be, be theory driven in the way that you could. Can I go back now online? Okay. I have one, one, two, 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 two. Let's try to take over. Okay. Um, it's a question about partnerships. Um, someone's asking, you know, um, is it obvious solution to grand challenges more partnership between firms, multinationals, and other institutions such as governmental, etc.? Um, asking what types of partnership are perhaps the best solution to address grand challenges. <clears throat> And the second question, quite intriguing one, right? Just coming in is um, amidst the sort of the current trend towards nationalisation, protection, protectionism, etc. Um, do you think that this could lead to um, restructuring multinationals and also the development of multiple identities within, yeah, within, yeah. within multinational? Yeah. Um, I've forgotten the first one. Now. Uh, <laughs> the second one, uh, yes. I mean, the, the second one uh, again. We've written a. Mark Cassa and myself have written a couple of pieces on the idea that the cartel might be coming. The idea that instead of having an integrated multinational trying to work across this fracture, you actually have a kind of cartel type arrangement where you have a part of the company in, in one side of it and part in the other loosely connected, not necessarily uh, through an ownership link. And I think, I think possibly the possible 
further argument there is that ownership has perhaps been a bit overplayed in, in international business because it started with ownership. It started with FDI owning foreign investment. And there are a lot of other methods, alliances and looser cartel type forms that might become the answer to dealing with these, uh, these fractures in the world economy. Uh, we might be at an early stage in doing that. But there have been a couple of companies, a bank and uh, AstraZeneca, were looking at strategies of trying to uh, work across the divide by other means than ownership. So there's some really interesting organizational uh, changes potentially down the line. What was the first question? The first question was about alliances, partnerships between... Oh, partnerships, yes. I, I mean, that that is very much the way that the... Uh, sustainable development goals are written to try and get multiple uh, stakeholders involved in these problems, which would be things like local and national government, multinational small firms and so on. I haven't talked about small firms, and I think, you know, that, that's a shame because, you know, you don't have to be big to be a multinational, you know, but, I know a company with eight employees that has a subsidiary in India. And, and uh, so it, we shouldn't always equate globalization and multinationals with size. There are small multinationals and need multinationals as well. So thanks for getting, letting me get that in at the end. Mm -hmm. The best I can do is to pick one more question from the audience, and I'm, I'm conscious of times, but that doesn't mean that we will end our conversation here. I mean, there will be uh, drinks outside and you will be able to ask Peter extra questions. So one last question from the audience. Hi, um, I'm Jose, and I'm a PhD student at the University of I was very interested in what you just talked about small and medium enterprises, just from the beginning how one of the big um, issues with early ERD um, international business so that it was focused on Western internationals. Um, do you think that there's a risk that as we look at this uh, increased growth for the firm or more involved growth and um, great challenges, that we might lose the point of view small and medium enterprises, which may be not so active in CSR or maybe not so able to address these grand challenges and that might be the problem. Yes and no. Uh, yes, because uh, the, the organs of uh, projection of voice are not as great for small firms as they are for large firms. And no, because small firms play such a really important role in the international business ecosystem that big multinationals could not manage without, right? A lot of stuff is outsourced, a lot of technical uh, and small and niche uh, activities carried out in small firms to which the multinationals piggyback and often buy up the companies, as you well know, one of the threats of a small firm working with a large one is the large firm will swallow it up. But small firms, uh, uh, um, should not definitely not be written out of the story. If you think of the global value chains, a lot of the a lot of the uh, real nitty gritty activity in global value chains is carried out by small firms. It, it's possibly that the, the the you know the forum for small firms being able to 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 really project the role that they play is not perhaps as great as it should be. If you go uh, to, to meetings at the UN, it's often the big multinationals who have their voices there at UNCTAD and other places, and not so much the small firms. So more should be done to, to, to get that voice in. And you've just done it. Excellent. Uh, I will now invite our head of school, Ken Maxwell, to come back and close the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, we set this uh, series up, original thinking series up um, a few years ago uh, to give our newly promoted and appointed professors the opportunity to, to, to enthuse us and to challenge us with what they profess. And I think tonight has been a stellar example uh, of uh, what we intended uh, this uh, series to be. So, 
please join me in thanking again uh, Peter uh, and Mario for standing <laughs> As, uh, as Mario said, we uh, have the opportunity to continue the questioning and discussions uh, outside or some uh, refreshments. Uh, we do have a very vibrant series of um, public lectures here in the school, and our next one, as part of our vital topic series, uh, will, in, uh, will be delivered by Paul Ormond, and the topic on that occasion will be a, a bit more national, levelling up the economics of levelling up. Again, a hugely significant and important uh, issue. So if you're free, please do join us uh, for that lecture also. But thank you very much for coming to uh, uh, the audience uh, online. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we do look forward to continuing the discussion uh, just outside in the foyer for those who are here in person. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.